Hello, my name is Chrissy Champagne, and you are listening to Residue, a true crime podcast dedicated to keeping you paranoid. Oh yes, Thanksgiving is upon us. Our cherished tradition, where our loved ones come from near and far to gather and share a bountiful feast. This U.S. holiday full of gratitude and togetherness is also one of the most dangerous days in the United States. On Thanksgiving, you will see an increased rate of drunk driving, serious injuries, and fires. On November 23rd, 1995, tragedy struck a family in Fairfax County, Virginia. This is The Thanksgiving Murder, the story of Ann Harper, episode 54. It is 2 a.m. on Thanksgiving Day, November 23rd in 1995. A 911 call has just been placed. The home of Elizabeth Harper is on fire. A neighbor named Michael Lee had just been arriving home after a night out when he saw the house in flames. He also saw Elizabeth Harper running towards him. She had just jumped out of the bathroom window in her master bedroom. Her neighbor called 911 and around 2.18 a.m. the fire department arrived. This neighbor had actually entered the home to try to save Elizabeth Harper's elderly mother. With Elizabeth's mother out safe from the burning home, she tells police and her neighbor that she thinks her children might be inside. They're home for the weekend from college to celebrate Thanksgiving, and her son Matt, age 18, and her daughter Anne, age 20, could possibly be inside of this home. The children had actually gone out to a movie earlier in the night with some friends, but Elizabeth believes they arrived home around 1 a.m. After speaking to neighbors, the police find out that Matt could possibly be at his girlfriend's house for the night. And after neighbors do end up calling Matt, Matt rushes to the hospital to meet his mother. But still, there is no sign of Anne. As firefighters are searching through the home, they do find the body of Anne Harper. Police are now tasked with telling Elizabeth Harper that her daughter is dead. They are also tasked with figuring out how and why this happened. There was no smoke in Anne's lungs. There was blood splatter on the floor. Anne was stabbed in the back and hit over the head. 20-year-old Anne Harper was a super smart, beautiful, and lovely girl. At this point in her life, she was studying at Holland University for a medieval studies degree. Her friends would say that she loved children. She was extremely kind to young kids. She loved her neighbors. She loved her friends. Everyone was really excited to see Anne succeed. To get to know Anne a little better, I wanted to share with you an article I came across. Now, this was written by Anna Journey. Anna Journey is an American poet and essayist. She grew up with the Harper kids. She was a fellow church member and classmate. And of Anne, she said, She had a slender, pointed nose, wide hips, thick, slightly messy hair, and without much makeup, a subtly old-fashioned paleness. Anne could have been cast as an extra in a movie about pioneers moving west in covered wagons. She'd smile at me through her bangs. Though she didn't have braces, I wondered if she might be what I'd eventually look like as a teenager. This quote came from a beautiful essay that the poet Anna Journey wrote. You can find more of her work on AnnaJourney.com. So as you can see, many people in this community were affected by the death of Anne Harper. Which is why this crime scene had detectives baffled.
Retired fire investigator Terry Hall says, every house fire has a story to tell. And in this house fire, it wasn't that hard for the investigators to realize that this was a case of arson. Right as they enter the living room, right across against the wall is a big plastic red gasoline container. From the living room, the investigators will follow the burn pattern up to the second floor. This burn pattern that they're following will lead them to Elizabeth Harper's bedroom. And in that path of the burn pattern, they will also find a single bladed knife. They say that there's almost no chance for finding DNA on this knife because it has been burned so badly. The burn pattern stops at Elizabeth's room and Elizabeth jumped out of her bathroom window to get away from the fire and then the knife was found right there. Detectives are going to start to believe that Elizabeth was actually the main target. While in the hospital, detectives are going to speak to Elizabeth and what she tells them is that she did think that she heard Anne's voice that night saying, what are you doing? But she didn't hear Anne feeling threatened or scared. She just thought she said it. What are you doing? So at this point, Elizabeth says she went into the bathroom. And as she opened the door to come out of her bedroom bathroom, she saw the fire. And she didn't know what to do because she couldn't get through her room. So that is when Elizabeth jumped out of her second story window. Investigators will also find that in the kitchen area, the phone has been taken off of the hook because it is 1995, so they are still using a landline. And with a landline, you cannot make a call if the receiver is off of the hook. So police are now starting to believe that this is a premeditated murder. Detectives also find that the drawers in the kitchen next to the stove were open. These two drawers held the knife and the rolling pin that was found next to Anne's body. This is what they believed was used to strike Anne in the head. And detectives are starting to think nobody else would know where these things were in a quick hurry. So obviously, whoever came into this kitchen and used these utensils as weapons knew this family and knew how to get around this house. So this is going to narrow down the suspects. And suspect number one for the police is going to be Michael Harper. Michael Harper is the father of Anne and Matt and the ex-husband of Elizabeth. Michael Harper hasn't lived in this home for at least five years. He's been living in New Jersey. And on this day that the fire happened and the murder happened, Michael was in New Jersey with his family. But police interview him and he gives them a little more information. Anne's father is able to tell detectives that Anne actually stopped and had lunch with her ex-boyfriend before coming home for Thanksgiving. The two are not romantically involved anymore and seem to be on friendly terms, but could this be a suspect? Could Anne's ex-boyfriend have done this? But Anne's ex-boyfriend is quickly ruled out by detectives when he talks to them, tells them that they had this really friendly lunch while she was on her way home, and he's been in Houston with his family this entire time for Thanksgiving. With two suspects now ruled out, police are canvassing the neighborhood, talking to neighbors about what the family is like, and they find out that although the family is a very friendly family, they're very quiet and protective of their, their home life. They don't really let the neighbors know about anything that's going on. They don't gossip. They don't talk about their personal problems. The day after the fire, detectives are going to come in and interview Matt. He is still sitting by his mother's bedside at the hospital. The fire marshal and homicide detective are going to come in to ask him questions. One of their biggest concerns was the fact that when Matt arrived at the hospital the night of the fire, the morning of the fire, Matt wasn't wearing any shoes. And his pants had this dark reddish brown stain on them. So he's still at the hospital. He hasn't left. He's still wearing the same thing. Detectives are going to now ask him, what is that stain on your pants, Matt? And Matt's going to say that this stain is from pasta that he made a few nights earlier. A few days ago, he's still wearing the same pants with a pasta stain. So investigators, they don't buy this. They ask Matt to hand over his jeans, and he does. And these jeans are sent to a crime lab. 
Upon further questioning, they're going to ask Matt what his relationship was like with his sister, and he says it was amazing. They had the best relationship ever. So since Matt was staying the night at his girlfriend's house the night of the fire, detectives ask his girlfriend if they can come have a look inside of her house. She's going to let them do this, but they say that she was very, very, very protective of Matt. She wouldn't talk. She wouldn't say anything. Even if she knew anything, this girl was not talking. But her silence isn't going to matter because she is going to let detectives come into her bedroom and search around. What they find is a smudge stain on one of her pillowcases. And to them, this looks like soot. So they ask Matt, what is this on your pillowcase? This is the one you were sleeping on that night. And he tells them, well, if it looks like soot, then it must be because I was hugging my mom the night I got to the hospital. And I must have got some some on me. So when I went back to my girlfriend's house and slept on the pillow, it just transferred to the pillow. And the police were like, mm, okay, that's not how that happens. And they take the pillowcase in for testing. So now we have the pillowcase and the jeans. And we are just waiting on some results at this point. On November 27th, this is four days after her death, the autopsy results for Anne are going to come back. And it is going to state there was blunt force trauma to her head above the hairline. The rolling pin was used. There was no smoke in her lungs. She did not die because of fire. Anne was literally stabbed in the back. These wounds match the knife found at her house. On the TV documentary series Homicide for the Holidays, journalist Gail Pennybecker says, The same tools that are used to create a Thanksgiving dinner where people sit around and appreciate each other were used in this murder. I found her statement so profound and it really was intense when I heard that. I just wanted to share it with you. You can see more of her interview on the TV show, Homicide for the Holidays. On December 14th, lab results are going to come back, and it is going to prove that the blood found on Matt's genes is a positive match to Anne. It has now been two weeks since Anne's death, and at this point, Matt has hired a family friend who is an attorney, so he has now just stopped talking to detectives completely. And... Matt's mom also stops talking to police. Matt's mother, Elizabeth, would not cooperate in this investigation anymore after this point. Anne's case is now going to go cold. One year will pass before any detectives look at this case and review it. Now, on the anniversary of all of their cases, police will start looking through the evidence again, just to give it a fresh eye approach, just to give it that... We waited a year, maybe we missed something, let's look over everything again. And this time, one of the investigators thinks, what was the strangest thing about that night? And that thing was the fact that Matt showed up to the hospital with no shoes on. While going over the old case file, one of the detectives sees some notes that an officer wrote. He said that several neighbors heard their dogs barking, and when they went out to inspect this, they saw a car that was driving towards the park. Now, this detective realizes, so that park actually has a creek that runs along the entire park. What if Matt threw his shoes in the creek? It's a wild shot. It's a wild card. Is that how you say it? Yeah, we'll say wild card. So the detective says, let's go look in the creek. And you know what they find? They find a pair of shoes. They find one shoe first and then later find the next shoe. And they're like, these shoes have been in this creek for over a year. How on earth are we going to prove that these are Matt's shoes? Well, there is a way to find out and that is called forensic podiatry. This involves analyzing footprints, footwear, the biomechanics of walking and running to assist in these criminal investigations. Forensic podiatrists will analyze evidence related to footprints, footwear, gait, and most importantly in this case, wear patterns. Because over time, shoes develop unique wear patterns based on the wearer's gait and activities. And analyzing these patterns in conjunction with footprints can provide additional evidence linking a suspect to a crime scene. 
And this is how they do it. They use casting. And with casting, footprints are left in soft materials like mud or sand. And forensic podiatrists will create casts using dental stone or other casting materials. These casts provide a three-dimensional model of the footprint for detailed examination. So detectives now want Matt to give a footprint cast. So detectives get a search warrant for the plaster cast, and they also get a search warrant for three pairs of Matt's shoes. They go to his university, and they tell Matt, you're going to have to give us a plaster cast of your feet. And Matt says, no. And police say, yeah, are you going to go to jail? So he gives them the plaster cast. So now we're just waiting around for the lab results to come back. And while detectives are doing that, they start thinking about what would possibly be Matt's motive. Matt is now attending Madison University and detectives go up to that college campus and they start asking around for info. They want to know everything they can about Matt. And they stumble upon this one friend who tells them that Matt had this friend who owned a bike shop. And what Matt would do is he would get bikes, he would dismantle the bike, and then he would sell the parts to his friend who owned the bike shop. But then he would make an insurance claim on his bike and collect the money for theft of the bike. This is insane. (laughs) But the detectives start thinking, well, do you think if he would do that with bikes, would he do that with his mom? Maybe she had a life insurance policy on her. Of course she did. Elizabeth had a $130,000 to $150,000 life insurance policy. And detectives are like, okay, this isn't a lot of money, but a kid, an 18-year-old, he might think this is a lot of money, and could this possibly be the motive? If this was the motive, in a lot of cases we've all heard, that means that he would have to take his sister out of the equation also because he doesn't want to split that money. Now, this is not what I'm saying happened. This is just me speculating on why someone would want the sister also to be out of the picture. Still, all of this is still not enough to charge Matt with murder. But on December of 1997, the results from the foot comparison come back. And these leather shoes are a positive match to Matt. It has now been almost two years since Anne's murder and an arrest warrant is now issued for Matt Harper. Detectives are going to go straight to James Madison University and they are going to get the campus police involved. They want to get Matt right now, even though he is in class, it does not matter to them. So they get to the classroom with the campus police and they show everyone the arrest warrant and they take Matt into the hallway and handcuff him in front of all of his classmates. A Fairfax County grand jury is going to indict Matt on first degree murder, arson, and attempted murder of Elizabeth Harper, his mother. But not everyone believes that Matt is guilty. His mother believes he is innocent and she is standing by his side. And when the community sees this mother saying that her son is innocent, a lot of people in the community are also on the side of innocence in this case. Here is another excerpt from Anna Journey's essay on the murder of Anne Harper. She was also friendly with Matt Harper, and this is how she described him. As a shy 11-year-old fifth grader in the spring of 1992, I thought the eighth grader Matt Harper the perfect sample of a teenage boy. I admired his dark chin-length mane, his wry sense of humor, his confidence in leading the procession of red and white robed choir members as we bobbed and trekked to our purple seats around the pipe organ. His starring role as the hero David in David and Goliath in his Birkenstocks and white socks. Anna Journey goes on to say, Although my mother saved the program for David and Goliath and a number of photographs of this musical, I've longed to find a videotape of the production. I remember a black tripod in the back of the nave with the wide eye of a camera recording away. I want to see for myself Matt singing the part of David, Matt killing Goliath, me looking with admiration on the star of the play. 
I want to find out if I can see anything in him, any hint of what's to come. Anna Journey's words, even years later, just prove how deeply an entire community can be affected. Matt never told his lawyers or investigators what happened the night that Ann was murdered. Now, investigators are just going to have to gather up as much evidence as they can and come up with their own idea of what went on in the house that night. They think that Matt came home. He had a key. He went into the garage, he got the gas can, and he went into the house. It was around 2 a.m. They believe Anne was in the living room studying. She saw her brother acting strange. She sees him pouring gasoline. This is when she is heard to say, what are you doing? They believe that Matt panicked. He got the rolling pin, the knife, and then he stabbed her in the back. Then he lit the house on fire. He poured the gasoline to keep his mom in the bedroom, and then he just left the house, leaving the knife on the floor. As he ran from the house, he threw his shoes in the creek. This is as much of the story as we're going to get. And this isn't even Matt's story. Matt's defense team is going to now suddenly say, we are negotiating with a Commonwealth attorney. We need to get a better sentence. And prosecutors wanted Matt in jail. So what is going to happen is he is going to plead guilty to second degree murder and arson. But why? They still do not know why this happened. On May 7th, 1999, at Matt's sentencing, he is going to speak. He's going to apologize to his mother. He will still never give a reason as to why this happened. But Matt says, When I think about my sister... I think about a beautiful young woman. I miss her every day. I can't believe that I took her life, but I know I did. Matt Harper pled guilty and received 35 years without parole. According to an article in the Washington Post in 1998, Hundreds of Ann Harper journal entries were going to be used in court during Matt Harper's trial. Ann would write, Mom and Matt raised voices because he wants to stay with Dad. Matt punched a hole in the wall and cracked a door. Scary. Mom and Matt got into another awful fight today. It got physical. Mom has an awful red mark on her right eye, and for a while, her lower face on the right side was swollen. In February of 1992, Anne's parents separated. In her journal, Anne wrote, Matt and I had a major fight, one of the biggest in years. He's been so damn aggressive toward me lately. Why? I haven't done anything. Matt Harper may never tell us what happened on that Thanksgiving night in 1995. But like their neighbor said, this family liked to stay quiet. They didn't like to air their dirty laundry. They kept their family feuds behind closed doors, and everyone in town believed that they were the picture-perfect family, the church-going family. So just as a reminder, this holiday season, if you're feeling down, if you're looking through Facebook or Instagram and you see all these beautiful family photos of these happy faces, we never know what is going on behind closed doors. Thank you so much for joining me again this week on Residue. I appreciate you all so much. Residue is written, created, hosted, produced, edited by Chrissy Champagne. That is me. If you enjoyed this episode of Residue, I think it would be super cool if you could just hit that little follow button on Apple or Spotify or anywhere you're listening. You can also follow me on Instagram at Residue Podcast, Facebook, Residue, a true crime podcast, TikTok, Residue Podcast. I also hear that giving someone a five-star review is the coolest thing to do right now. So if you want to be super cool and trendy and make me smile, just leave a five-star review. I am so excited to see you all again next week. And until then, stay safe and stay 
Paranoid.